Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 35, The History of the Central African Republic. So today's drink of choice is Karkanji. Karkanji is a hibiscus tea that seems to be most commonly associated with Chad, but also is present in northern parts of the Central African Republic. It's apparently commonly sold on street corners or communal events, so maybe somewhat similar to how lemonade is sometimes sold in America. Overall, the tea is really, really good. Hibiscus tea on its own is really nice, and the ginger really adds some nice spice to it. Only thing I will say is the recipe I got calls for a lot of sugar, and I only used half the sugar they recommended, and even then, it felt like a little too sweet. So if you do make it, probably just go a little bit easy on the sugar. But yeah, the tea is really good, the recipe will be in the description. Also fun fact for fans of the Elder Scrolls cookbook, surely a large percentage of my audience, the recipe is almost a quicker version of the Red Mountain flower tea that's in the book, but with some different spices, more sugar, and colder. But on to the Central African Republic which is located in, you guessed it, Central Africa. Although it isn't actually the central most point on the African continent, it is surrounded by Chad to the north, Sudan and South Sudan to the east, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Republic of the Congo to the south, and Cameroon to the west. The country is overall quite tropical. The southernmost parts are tropical rainforests, while the northernmost parts are arid and desert-like. However, the rest of the country is humid, semi-forested savannas. It also has its southern border as the Ubangi River, while its northern border with Chad is the Ishari River. Just bring it up because it's important later. The population of the Central African Republic is mostly concentrated in the south, around the Ubangi River, or near the border of Cameroon, with the capital city of Bangui having around one-fourth of the country's entire population in the city. The country's almost 5.5 million people are divided between many different ethnic groups spread throughout the country, with it estimated there being around 80 different groups in the country. Some of the largest are the Gabaya in the west, the Banda found throughout the country, the Manja in the middle of the country, and the Sara found throughout the border with Chad. There also is a significant, although proportionally small, number of non-Africans found in the country, mostly being either missionaries, NGOs, or armed mercenaries, slash peacekeepers, slash soldiers, which tend to be concentrated in and around the capital. Language-wise, the Central African Republic, or as it is sometimes referred to as, the car is a francophone-speaking country. French, however, is spoken by less than 30% of the country, and is often only used when speaking in a more formal, or high-class, environment. Instead, most people will use Sango, a Creole language developed as a trade language along the Ubangi River, as a language of inter-ethnic communication, and also as a sort of patriotic alternative to French. Other ethnic groups will, of course, speak their own ethnic languages. Finally, religion-wise, the country is mostly Christian. The numbers are unclear. Different sources say different things, but it seems like, at the very least, over 50% are Christian. It's also unclear what Christian group is the largest, with some sources saying it's roughly even between Catholics and Protestants, while others say Protestants dominate. Big picture, though, Christians are very much present and concentrated in the South. In the North, more of the population is Muslim, with most Muslims being Sunni Muslim and somewhere around 7 to 15% being Muslim. There also are various traditional religious groups, with many mixing Christianity and folk beliefs, with beliefs in witchcraft and sorcery apparently relatively common. The Kar, before the 19th century, had very few powerful and large-scale kingdoms or empires within its borders. We do know, however, that by the 3000s BCE, there would have been some large-scale societies in the country, since stuff like the Buar Megaliths were created during this time. Trade also was present in the country, especially around the Ubangi River, part of the reason why Songo was created. And by the 1700s, products from the New World such as Minoka, maize, and tobacco were all beginning to grow in the region. In the 19th century, kingdoms, sultanates, and empires found the Sahel began moving south into the Central African Republic. While these powerful kingdoms never took control of most of the country, they would launch slave raids south, taking people and selling them either on the West African coast to Europeans or in domestic slave markets. These slave raids helped create the seeds of animosity between Southern Central Africans and Northern Central Africans. By the late 1880s, the French were beginning to move into Central Africa, founding Bangui in 1889. The French would at first administer the territory from its colony in the Congo, but by 1903 the French colony of Ubangi Shari would be established, a reference to the rivers that surround the colony. In case you were curious on the French thoughts of the car, 
It was described by Big Game Hunters as either the Cinderella of the French Empire, a reference to how the colony was underappreciated and thus great for hunting African wildlife, or alternatively, it was the trash can of the French Empire, because it was a backwater very few thought about. The colony was underdeveloped largely because it was both landlocked, difficult to traverse, and seen as holding little economic value. It was so little cared about by the French that in 1911, it gave the western half of the colony to Germany in exchange for greater rights in Morocco. After France invaded German Cameroon in World War I, it tried to give Ubangi Cheri to the British in exchange for territory in West Africa, but this was rejected. Ubangi Cheri wasn't a colony the French were really proud of or cared about, so the civilizing mission the French attempted in its other colonies was quite limited. Instead, the French tried to model the colony off Belgian rule in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It allowed private companies to de facto control large parts of the colony. These companies often used both local chiefs and brute force to extract resources such as rubber or ivory. Those that failed to meet their quotas were killed. One infamous tactic was to kidnap women and children in order to force the men to work harder. This led to one massacre where 68 women and children were locked in a tiny house with only a couple of small air slits. Only 20 would survive with the rest suffocating to death as women tried to hold their children to air slits so they could breathe. Massacres like this and the brutality that the French allowed did lead to some protests in France itself, forcing the French to rein in the power of these private companies. However, many Europeans were able to bypass these rules, which often had an only marginal effect. By the 30s, the French were beginning to move away from the solely private company model and began to turn Ubangi Shuri into a cotton powerhouse. Most of the people in the country were forced to work as de facto slaves, serving as cotton farmers. While there would be several uprisings and protests against the French, most were fairly small. The only real exception would be the Congo Wara Rebellion. The rebellion, which occurred in the late 20s to early 30s, was a rebellion by several different African tribes and ethnic groups, led by a religious figure known as Karnu. Karnu was said to have spoken with God himself, and while his movement initially was just boycotting and protesting the French, and the Muslim Fula people who aided the French, it eventually evolved into a widespread armed conflict, engulfing most of the region, with its fighters believing Karnu's magical powers would protect them from harm, and the rebellion eventually emerged as a broad protest of French rule with little and limited ideology, at least according to Louise Lombard in her book State of Rebellion. While the rebellion would be crushed, it would inspire future Central African revolutionaries and nationalists. It also foreshadowed several aspects that would be important for future conflicts in the car. Tensions between northern Muslim peoples and southern Christian peoples, a rebellion whose fighters have a deeply rooted faith in superstition, and those opposing the status quo often fighting less to change the system and more to protest those at the top. After World War II, France gave more autonomy to their African colonies, partially due to its weakness post-war, and also to hopefully prevent further nationalist agitation in its colonies. Also at this point, more schools were built and infrastructure somewhat improved. However, by the 50s, most Africans were opposed to French rule, and rallied around Bartholomew Boganda. Boganda was originally a Catholic priest, but in the 50s moved to an anti-colonial direction, and formed the Movement for the Social Evolution of Black Africa, or Mason. Mason quickly found the support of most of the population, and managed to win an overwhelming majority in several colonial elections in a row. By 1958, it was clear France would be unable to hold on to its colonies, with large-scale revolts in Algeria and Cameroon. Boganda actually proposed the CAR to join with other French colonies in Central Africa, and even the Belgian colonies and Angola, to form the United States of Latin Africa although this didn't pan out. However, instead the car would be formed and granted full independence by 1960. However, Boganda wouldn't live to see it, being killed in a plane crash in 1959, which many accuse the French of playing some part in. Instead, the car would be led by David Daco. Daco was simultaneously an ally to France, letting French advisors continue to dominate his government and bureaucracy, while also attempting to remove foreign control of the economy and assert the car as an independent state. He also banned all political parties except Mason, and established a one-party dictatorship, and corruption followed. Daco's rule would be overthrown at the end of the year in 1965, and 1966 would see Jean Bidet Bokassa take power. Bokassa is probably one of, if not the most famous figure in Central African history, due to his attempt at establishing an empire and his comically expensive coronation celebration. While yes, this empire was pretty embarrassing and ridiculous overall, it's also important to remember that his first almost 11 years as a ruler was as a president, a dictator that crushed his political opponents with rumors that he ate them or fed them to crocodiles, but still nominally as a normal politician. Bokassa in the 60s and early 70s sought to build up the nation, 
He greatly improved infrastructure in the country, crushed bandits and rebel groups, brought order, built universities, and apparently grew the economy, although poverty was still found throughout the country. It's interesting. Outside the car, Bokasa is laughed at as an idiot, and the events early in his reign are almost always ignored, but within the car itself, there seems to be a more sympathetic, although not necessarily positive view of him. However, Bokasa's reputation as an egomaniacal maniac isn't entirely unfounded either. He even in his early days was infamous for spending a lot on himself and his family. In order to get close to Gaddafi's Libya, he converted to Islam, which he abandoned after only two months in order to realign with the French. In December 1976, Bokasa declared himself emperor, likening himself to Napoleon and spending 20 million in order to impress both his countrymen and foreign diplomats, many of which didn't show up. Bokasa's reputation internationally collapsed, leading to a loss in foreign investment in the country. In 1979, Bokasa ordered all school children be required to buy school uniforms from a company his wife controlled. This led many poverty-stricken Central African children and teenagers to protest in the streets. Bokasa had the army and police crack down on the remaining children, resulting in around 100 being killed. In an eerily similar circumstance to the 1903 massacre I talked about earlier, 33 children were thrown in a tiny prison cell meant for only one, and most of those children suffocated to death. By this point, Bokasa had lost all support, and in September of that year, rebellious Central African and French soldiers overthrew the government and restored Dachau to power. So how was Dachau's second time around? Well, he was overthrown in 1981, so not great. Instead, General André Kolingba took control of the country, setting up a military dictatorship until 1985, when he set up a one-party state. He eventually fell out of power in 1993, after losing elections that year to Ange Philippe Patassi, the first democratically elected president of the car. Patassi would, however, suffer from conflict and rebellion during his years in office. In 2003, Patassi would be overthrown in another coup by Francois Bozizé. I realize I've just thrown out a whole bunch of names to you, but I wanted to just quickly get through the end of the 20th century in the car. The big thing to keep in mind is the car politically at this time is experiencing political violence and coups, and Bozizé, a southern Christian, was controlling the country by the 2000s. During this time, the Dakar would become more and more reliant on foreign aid and foreign peacekeepers. Government services were largely unavailable, conflict had made getting an education and moving up in life an almost impossible task, and since many businesses had left the country by the end of Bokasi's rule, the economy was in shambles. Foreign aid was required by many Central Africans to survive, and so groups like the UN, the AU, international NGOs, and even missionary groups stepped in to try and help the car. But they had and have largely failed in preventing poverty in the country and halting violence. Often all they can really do is put a band-aid on a problem and not actually solve the root issues. Even worse, some peacekeepers have been involved in sexual abuse, corruption, and there are frequent accusations that the French and or Chadians have actively sought to harm the country so it's easier for them to exploit it, which has led to backlash against traditional NGOs, foreigners, and some peacekeepers. If you look at international metrics for stuff like the GDP, HDI, or PCI, the car almost always ranks as one of the worst just because of how poor it is, and how ineffective the state is and the rules have been in raising the people up out of poverty. Central African politics have also moved further away from the people since the 80s. Admittedly, Central Africans rarely were ever close to their leaders, but increasingly more and more Central African politicians sought to do politics outside the country, often being more willing to go to international conferences outside the country than go to their own constituents. Even rebel groups often only barely know who their leaders are. Central Africans overall have had very little connection to those that ruled them, especially as their leaders became more and more corrupt over the years. One example of this corruption would be Roblox. They became a common staple during Bozizé's rule. Roblox would be set up throughout the country, with military, police, or other state officials allowed to harass any they saw fit often requiring a bribe to pass unless you wanted to have your possessions searched through for hours. Notably, Muslims that went through roadblocks would be subject to additional harassment and were often made to pay double the fines. Muslims were often accused of being foreigners and or illegal traffickers, a sign that many southern Central Africans didn't see the Muslims in the north as belonging to the same state as them. This has been helped by a recent influx of Muslim merchants who believe the country is a good country to do business in and set up shop there, which has led to accusations that Muslims are taking the wealth they make in the car and take it overseas. By the 2010s, it was clear that tension between Muslims and Christian Central Africans was becoming more prominent, and apparently many rebel fighters in later years would argue that Roblox helped radicalize them to this fact. Bozizé had experienced a rebellion in the Central African Bush War, which lasted from 2004 to 2007. 
but he would face a much larger rebellion in 2012, the start of the current Central African Civil War. Various rebel groups, mostly based in the north and mostly made up of Muslim fighters, formed a coalition known as the Selika. The Selika would start to take territory and began pushing south, while the Central African Armed Forces, or FACA, with the aid of other African countries tried to halt their advance, they failed. Part of this had to do with FACA just being weak and ineffective, with many soldiers breaking on first contact with the enemy. Some Central Africans have argued that many Selika fighters were Chadians, and therefore many Chadian peacekeepers were secretly fighting for the enemy. And even worse, many peacekeepers which were supposed to help restore peace to the car and protect civilians, instead chose to spend their time just protecting government buildings. By March of 2013, Selika fighters were sieging the capital, and only, ironically, Chadian and South African troops were actually engaging them. By April, Bolzize was in exile, Selika had taken the capital, and widespread looting and murder began to take place. Selika put Michel Joltodia, a Muslim and rebel commander, in charge. However, while Selika literally translates from Songo into coalition, Selika's various groups and rebel fighters quickly broke apart and began fighting each other. In response to the looting, a group known as the anti balaka formed. The anti balak was formed as a coalition of ex bozize supporters, local self-defense groups, and just straight-up criminals that all sought to fight Selika or just any Muslims they found. Anti Balaka supporters were almost entirely Christian or animalist and quickly took to revenge killings against Muslims in southern Kar. By early 2014, Jotodia, having failed to create peace in the country, resigned, letting an interim government take over. This interim government, while it did somewhat stabilize and was able to hold the area around Bangui, most of the country fell into the control of various rebel groups, bandits, and warlords, who set up their own de facto administrations. One of the largest ex Selica factions, the Popular Front for the Rebirth of the Central African Republic, or FPRC, actually declared independence for the north of the country, forming the Republic of Lagon in 2015, although this was largely ignored by everyone. In 2016, Faustin Argentin Tudera was elected president. Tudera tried to make the car more friendly to international businesses, hoping that improving the economy might result in less violence. However, militias and rebel groups continued to occupy large portions of the country, making it difficult for him to govern. It became even harder for the government after the French left in 2016, leaving just FACA and the UN Menisca mission. Massacres and battles continued into the 2020s. In 2020 and 2021, presidential and parliamentary elections were held, in which Tudero won a second term. However, rebel groups accused the election process of being unfair, and shut down polling stations in several parts of the country, resulting in turnout only being about 35% of the population. Actually, even today, the final results of the parliamentary elections aren't known, because the second round results never happened. An alliance known as the Coalition of Patriots for Change was formed, consisting of the FPRC, factions of the anti balaka and several ex groups, headed by Bolzize, all attempted to overthrow Tudera. After only a couple of weeks, they managed to take most of the country and besiege the capital. However, they were driven off by a coalition of Rwandan and Russian troops. Russia has since 2018 been providing more and more material and armed assistance to the car. Largely, this has been seen as Russia trying to increase its influence in Africa. At least in the car, it seems to have worked. With it seeming, at the very least in Bangui, the Russians are quite popular, considering they helped prevent the capital from being taken, and have helped the army retake large chunks of the country, acting in a much more decisive role than the French and UN peacekeepers before them. However, there also are reports of Russian troops massacring civilians, like in the Agbaido massacre, where 65 civilians were killed. Now admittedly, Russian troops aren't the only ones to commit horrific human rights abuses, as literally every group in the conflict has, and it remains unclear what the long-term impact of the Russians will be. It could end with the Russians viewed the same way as the French, ultimately unable to restore peace, and just using the conflict for its own means, but it's too early to really tell. So will the conflict end anytime soon? Unfortunately, probably not. There is really no reason for any of the groups in the conflict to end the conflict. Regional tension and dissatisfaction with the status quo is still very much present. Rebels are able to create their own de facto states and play governor. The government is able to steal foreign aid meant to help their country. And so long as the rebels remain away from the capital, they don't really have too much to worry about, especially because they aren't in the country half the time. Foreign powers are able to play geopolitics and possibly gain more influence on the continent. 
and businesses allegedly are able to illegally steal resources like diamonds, gold, and timber. Several rebel groups did surrender to the government late in 2022, and the government does control more land now than ever, but many parts of the North remain outside government control, and the latest attack I could find occurred on January 26th, where Russian and government forces attempted and failed to take several villages in the North. So why does the Central African Republic exist? It was created by the French and then largely left to suffer. It was a colonial creation like many countries on the African continent, but it was left exploited and unprepared, perhaps more so than any other country in Africa, and bad leadership, coups, and violence have exasperated the problem. All this has led the country to where it is today. Hopefully, peace and prosperity can come, but it sadly looks more likely to come later rather than sooner. Next, we will move just right up north to Chad, prepare for Islamic sultanates, the French again, a war with Toyotas, and probably some unfunny Chad meme jokes. So thanks for listening, thanks for watching. So yeah, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, Luisa Lombard's book, State of Rebellion, is a really interesting book if you want to learn more about the conflict in the Central African Republic, especially if you want to learn, like, the dimension and dynamics and, like, sort of the um, the sociology around it. I don't fully agree with all the claims that she makes in the book, and it is a, it's sort of outdated. It was made in 2016, so, like, not super long ago, but, you know, since then there's been a lot of things that have happened. But I would say overall, it's a pretty interesting book. It doesn't really, um, like, it's not really a history book. I mean, you'll learn some history, but it's not really like, here's the entire history of the Central African Republic. But it's more of just like, here is an examination of kind of the dimensions around the conflict in um, the Central African Republic. But yeah, um, up next, I will talk about Serbian political parties. Then I will talk about Greek political parties. Um, and then I will get to the history of Chad. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you want, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this episode are African Biographics video on Jean Baudel Bokassa, BBC's news article, Good Old Days Under Bokassa, Cornbun News article, and this is in French, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna attempt to pronounce it. We'll see how it goes. Centra Afrique de Mercenaires de Wagner and Soda Faka captures Palas Rebels. Uh, France 24's report Central African Republic under Russian influence. Geography Now's video on the Central African Republic. History with Hilbert's video Why is the Central African Republic at war with itself? History Ville's video How the Central African Republic was colonized. Louisa Lombard's book State of Rebellion. Mr. History's video A Super Quick History of the Central African Republic. New Africa's video on Jean Badel Bokassa which actually promotes a really interesting theory that, like, Bokassa's sort of egomaniacal mania was kind of the results of the French. It's interesting. If you're going to, like, watch any of the videos, I would actually really, really recommend that one. New Africa is, like, a great history channel. Um, Vice News documentary, War in the Central African Republic. The brutal fight that's left the Central African Republic in chaos. The Central African Republic is enlisting Russians in the war against rebels. And Russian mercenaries are allegedly raping and murdering Central African civilians. And finally, Wikipedia.